Eva Kalkistakis. I practiced that. <laughs> um, here today from Rutgers University. Um, she did her undergrad at Rutgers and was a postdoc at the University of Rochester. And now she's back at Rutgers, um, just across the river. Um, Eva has been uh, an enemy of mine for many years. She was on CDF, I was on D0. Um, she's now on CMS, or as one of the here at NYU. Um, but it's good to keep your enemies close. And um, she has worked on various <laughs> searches for new physics. Um, right now, she's convener of the non-hydronic uh, subgroup of the exotics uh, uh, team at CMS. And in the past, she was convener of the supersymmetry group, which is a big job. And so she's going to tell us about exploring the energy frontier at the Great. Uh, thank you, Andy. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here at NYU. Um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a nice trip uh, <laughs> coming here across the river, as, as you pointed out. Uh, so yeah, so, t so today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the status of the LHC and then you know, kind of give you a little bit of a tasting menu of the types of uh, results that we have uh, and what we've learned uh, with the data that we have so far. Uh, so, but just as a, a brief introduction, since, uh, you know, I assume that not everyone here is a particle physicist. Uh, so just to remind you, the, <clears throat> this is our uh, table of <clears throat> fundamental particles that make up the standard model, uh, where we have uh, our quarks, uh, our charged leptons, our neutral leptons, uh, and the bosons, which now includes the, uh, the Higgs that we discovered at the LHC back in 2012. <laughs> Uh, and so, so this uh, table is nice and uh, compact, but it doesn't tell the full story because you know, the standard model, is, it really is one of the greatest achievements in science. It uh, makes many predictions that we've measured very precisely, um, but uh, of course it doesn't uh, have, give us the whole story, which is why we have the LHC to try to answer some of the fundamental questions that remain. Uh, so in order to perhaps motivate a little bit why we have the LHC. Uh, it, you know, I, I kind of like to show this, uh, uh, this, this table that shows the history of accelerators. So on the <clears throat> y-axis, uh, we have uh, effectively the, the center of mass energy uh, of, of these colliders uh, as a function of time, so, or a year, that, the, uh, that that particular collider started. In Blue are hadron colliders, and in red we have electron-positron colliders. And I've tried to highlight with the little arrows at, at you know different places where discoveries were made. Obviously, it's not all of them, but I just highlight a few. So, for example, back in 1974, uh, where uh, the, we had this discovery of the charm quark in the form of the JSI meson at SLAC. Uh, and at Brookhaven, which triggered the so-called November Revolution in particle physics. <clears throat> uh, so that was uh, uh, in the form of an electron, uh, po uh, positron, electron collider, electron positron collider. And in uh, the case of the discovery of the W and Z bosons, they came almost a decade later, uh, and it happened at CERN at the, at the, uh, at the SPS, so uh, the, the uh, proton-antiproton collider. Uh, then about 10 years after that, we discovered the top quark at Fermilab, simultaneously at C CDF and D0, as Andy pointed out earlier. <coughs> and, uh, and then in 2012, of course, the uh, major discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN. And here, just for reference, you can sort of follow these different particles, and you can sort of see, uh, you know, we've been sort of slowly going up. This is the particles and their masses. You probably can't see the scales, but it's a log scale, and you can sort of see we've you know, uh, been kind of going up, uh, uh, up, up uh, in, in mass in terms of discovery of different particles. So the LHC obviously discovered the Higgs boson, but of course the uh, question uh, is, well, what, what can we discover next? <clears throat> but a few words about the standard model uh, Higgs boson, just as a little refresher, because I am going to tell you the status of that. Okay, we discovered it, but what have we done, you know, what have we learned since then? Okay. So um, just to, a, a brief reminder, of course, uh, the, we've got the Higgs mechanism, 
uh, or the, the so-called uh, so the so-called Higgs mechanism or the Bru Angler Higgs mechanism, which was first postulated in the 60s, uh, and which uh, uh, hypothesized a uh, Higgs field which was self-interacting uh, and gave a, a non-zero ground state or VEV uh, on the order of a few hundred GeV. Uh, and uh, what it does, it's a, it breaks the electrosymmetry, it's broken, and it uh, gives rise to the neutral Higgs boson in the form of a scalar particle. So that's a question that we've had since we discovered it. Is it the particle of the standard model with uh, a property like this? Um, so this, uh, this Higgs uh, particle, this Higgs field, which gives rise to the Higgs particle, here's the Higgs field here and the, the Mexican hat potential, uh, the masses of the fermions, so the quarks and leptons in the table that I showed you earlier, and the gauge bosons <coughs> from uh, 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 the electroweak force, uh, the Ws and Zs and, and the Z boson, they arise through a dynamical interaction with the Higgs field. And you can see that in the form of these equations here, right? So here's the masses of the fermions <coughs> are related to the coupling or the Yukawa coupling uh, times this VEV. Uh, and the masses of the Ws and Zs are, are related in this fashion. Right, so then the discovery of the Higgs, like I said, in 2012, well, we measured its mass, and I'll show you the stat current status of the mass and how precisely we measured it. It's quite impressive, actually. Uh, of, uh, around 125 GeV, and then since then, we've been trying to study it to verify that it truly is the Higgs of the standard model. What does that stand for? Vacuum expectation value. Okay, so uh, what are the big questions uh, at, at the LHC? So obviously we're trying to answer very big, broad questions, very ambitious people. Um, so, uh, so obviously, you know, we're cl clearly testing the standard model in the form of, well, obviously discovering the Higgs, but measuring um, uh, the properties of all the particles very precisely. But in particular with the Higgs, you know, is there more to the story? So why is, for example, the Higgs so light? Its mass is at 125 GeV, so here this diagram <clears throat> shows you the different forces and the point at which they, uh, for example, the weak and electromagnetic force forces uh, uh, join, which is at the weak scale, which is about 100 GeV. So, so the, uh, the Higgs mass is, is on the scale of electroweak symmetry. So, <clears throat> so we're exploring the electroweak symmetry breaking scale by studying the Higgs. Um, so, you know, begs the question, well, maybe there's, you know, so there's many motivations for new physics to also appear there. Uh, of course, there's also a <coughs> cosmological connection. So one of the big questions in science in general is, well, what is dark matter? So we all, we have all, uh, I'm sure have seen this, <laughs> this pie chart, um, where, you know, we know that dark matter is made up of about a quarter of everything that's in the universe. So what is it? And if, it's in the, if dark matter is a form of a particle, well, perhaps we can produce dark matter particles at the LHC and understand something about, uh, about that as well. And of course, there's always the question of, well, the things that we don't think about, right? So the LHC is really also there to explore the unknown, right? We're really at the energy frontier where we're exploring energies that have, you know, uh, that, you know, that uh, we re reached co co uh, collisions of particles of, ha of these hadrons of the protons <coughs> at energies that we've never explored before. So, that, you know, so perhaps nature is more, quote unquote, exotic and, uh, you know, time will tell uh, whether or not we're, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, na what nature really, uh, um, uh, how nature will reveal itself. So ultimately what we want to know is there new physics beyond the standard model. So SM, standard model, or BSM. <coughs> so here's the LHC, or an aerial picture of, uh, uh, of where the LHC resides, which is on the border between Switzerland and France. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, as you know, it's a proton-proton collider, 27 kilometers in circumference, about 300 feet underground, 100 meters underground. And it's, it's large. I mean, the L in LHC really you know, lives up to its name. Um, usually what I point out here is, oh, okay, here's Lake Geneva, uh, and uh, here is the landing strip of uh, the airport in Geneva, so it's an international airport, so that kind of already gives you the scale, and, uh, and then here is uh, 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 the, the size of the ring. 
Uh, and then there's four experiments. The two experiments that, um, uh, that you, you perhaps you're most familiar with, the CMS experiment, which is uh, the, uh, the experiment that I'm, that I'm on, <coughs> the ATLAS experiment, which is across the ring uh, um, on the other side, which the, the team here uh, at NYU is on. And then there's two, and so these are generic multipurpose experiments and the experiments that discover the Higgs. And then there's two additional ones that are more specialized. So LHCB uh, focuses on um, uh, uh, physics with B quarks and Elise, which uh, uh, primarily is on during the periods. Actually, the LHC also collides uh, heavy ions, so there's a, a nuclear physics aspect to the LHC as well that, uh, that uh, Elise is, uh, uh, um, uh, is a detector that is one of the detectors that's also running during those periods. So it's clearly large just in general, but it's also large in terms of international effort. Uh, 85 countries, that probably is possibly even already outdated. It's 85 countries and counting every year. New, new um, member countries join these experiments. Thousands of scientists, and it's a really great opportunity for students as well. There's thousands of students that are doing a lot of the work here. Um, so let me just give you the timeline, because I'm going to be using uh, some terminology throughout the talk, and I want to make sure that, 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 uh, uh, that you know what I mean. So the LHC <clears throat> initially turned on uh, in 2010 and ran uh, for a couple of years at center of mass energies of 7 TeV. So the center of mass energy is just twice the energy of each of the proton beams, so 3.5 TeV each. So 7 TeV center of mass energy. And then in 2012, we ran, we, uh, the LHC bumped up the uh, energy to 8 TeV. Uh, and uh, so the, the combination of these two data taking periods we call run one, and it's the data set in which the Higgs boson was discovered. Um, and then since then, so, so here's run one, this is also a timeline. We had a, a short uh, a shutdown where the experiments and the LHC itself, in particular the accelerator, did some upgrades uh, and was able then to increase the center of mass energy close to the design energy. The design energy is 14 TeV and was able to uh, uh, kick up the energy to about 13 TeV. It restarted in 2015 and we've been running since then. <clears throat> it exceeded expectations and I'll show you about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, and is uh, intended to run through 2018. Um, so actually, every, uh, at the end of every year, uh, the LHC turns off just for uh, a couple of months, and we're about to start up again for 2017, and then it's going to run through 2018. So we call that period run two, and then I, and you get the idea. Then again, there'll be a, a shutdown for a couple of years, run three, and then beyond that, there'll be a longer shutdown where then we'll, the high luminosity LHC will run, where the detectors will be completely gutted. Uh, at brand new detectors, uh, and uh, the LHC will be running at much, much higher luminosity. Okay, so here's the we are here sign. So clear this is, clearly this is a long program, and we're still at the beginning of it. Okay, so the next slide here is a little animation, which I noticed when I was in your other building. I got off the elevator, and the first thing I saw was this animation. So perhaps some of you have actually seen it, but I really love to show it. For me, it never gets old, <laughs> so, um, because it really uh, shows, uh, it demonstrates in just a very short amount of time uh, you know, how amazing uh, the uh, LHC as a collider itself. Okay, so you see here, <clears throat> so we don't start off, I mean, the, these 13 TeV center of mass energy collisions don't happen just like that. They ha you know, the, the protons uh, get to 13 TeV in, in, in different steps. So there's, uh, you know, this uh, smaller uh, uh, collider, the PS, then it goes into the, the SPS, which actually was the host of the electron positron collider. <clears throat> and then uh, when it gets enough energy, it goes into the LHC ring. So here's now from the point of view, actually, of, of the protons. And in the LHC tunnel, 100 meters underground, we just crossed the Swiss-French border. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think at some point we saw the standard model Lagrangian over there on the side, but uh, I think we missed it. Uh, and then you can see the proton. It was the point of view of the proton. Remember, the proton is made up of quarks, and you saw that they were colored. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, a lot of thought went into this. It's really quite nice. And then eventually, so this is the Atlas detector. The protons collide, uh, and, uh, and then we take a snapshot with these very high resolution and impressive uh, detectors of, of uh, uh, and take a, a pictures, high resolution pictures, so to speak, 
uh, of these uh, uh, of, of these collisions. Okay, and just to you know kind of emphasize the fact, I mean, it's not a single proton hitting a single proton, right? These are the, the protons in the LHC. You know, there's there's billions of protons in each bunch, right? There's hundreds of bunches, and there's billions of them. I'll actually say something about that in a little bit. Okay, but just to kind of also. <coughs> Uh, say something a little bit about, you, you might hear me, uh, you know, talking about uh, these different uh, things throughout the talk, so I just kind of wanted to, uh, uh, you know, put them in, put you in perspective. So this, this is a picture of the CMS detector looking along what we call the z-direction. So we define our reference frame, so this is the transverse plane, and the z-direction is the direction of the proton beam. So the protons collide, uh, are coming, and they collide along, along the z-axis here. Uh, so this is the uh, picture of the CMS detector, and just for scale, you can see this is a, a one a story high, so the CMS detector is, you know, three or four stories, stories high, really uh, very large, uh, yet compact. I mean, Atlas is uh, um, uh, much larger in, in that sense, uh, can contain uh, uh, CMS within it. Um, so this is the transverse plane, the XY plane, and you may hear me talking about transverse quantities like transverse momentum. Uh, or, uh, um, or missing transverse energy. So we really mostly focus on quantities in the tra transverse plane, which is perpendicular to the, the beam axis. Uh, uh, well, mo you know, when the collisions are head on, they'll, they'll mostly be, the particles will, will, will scatter uh, mostly in the transverse plane anyway, but knowing the, uh, the uh, you know, conservation of momentum in the, in the Z direction is, is, is actually quite difficult, so we focus in the transverse plane. The other thing we, you may see me talking about pseudo rapidity or you know rapidity or pseudo rapidity, and you can sort of see here. So if this is the z axis, so the, the middle is the interaction point, it's a it's a um, function of the polar angle, and it's a, a neat way of being able to uh, say, in, at least in the polar, polar angle frame, <coughs> what uh, where the particles are. So you know, so most of the new physics. Uh, and, you know, the head-on collisions would appear in the central part of the detector. So you can see this is eta plus one and eta minus one in terms of pseudo rapidity. And very forward direction is, uh, is the direction that we have. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so I, fl I flipped it. I flipped it. So this is, so this is Z, which would then be in, into the page. So then, so then eta is like this. So in case I have that on one of my slides, I wanted to kind of make sure that. But then in terms of particle ID, I mean, this is really, you know, the detector technology that goes into these experiments is really impressive, right? So what do we do? So now this is just a slice. Again, a transverse slice. You can see this is now looking, uh, at that little cartoon there on the, on, in the corner is looking along the beam axis, and this is just a, a slice in that uh, uh, of the detector. And you can see that the detectors are these layers, uh, you know, different layers. So we enclose the collisions by these layers of different detectors. And what we try to do is make the, the following measurements, right? We need to know <clears throat> the particle's momentum, the particle's charge, right? Uh, so there's a magnetic field. So in the case of CMS, there's a solenoid. <clears throat> the T in ATLAS stands for toroid. Uh, so yeah, by the way, I should have mentioned, since I'm on CMS, I'll, you know, I may be a little bit more biased in terms of what I show, in terms of pictures that I show, uh, more towards CMS, uh, but the, the spirit of, of the detectors is the same. The Atlas has these big toroid magnets, uh, uh, the, S in C, uh, the S in CMS stands for solenoid, and we need that to be able to measure the charge of the particles as they bend in the magnetic field. We need to know their energy, so as particles go through, they're absorbed, and you can see then different, the different patterns that different particles make. So for example, <clears throat> a photon will get absorbed in the electromagnetic part calorimeter, since it's an electromagnetic particle, uh, but won't bend because it's uh, neutral, whereas an electron will look like a photon, except it's a charged particle, it'll leave a track in our tracking detector, our silicon detector in the case of CMS. And, uh, and then deposit all of this energy in the electromagnetic alarimeter. So these are just, just you know, two differences that there were. We can sort of exploit the differences between the two particles and then be able to identify their species. And then you can see, obviously, since the M in CMS is a muon, you can see here this uh, uh, blue curve is the pattern that a muon would make. Muon is minimizing, will penetrate through all of the detectors and then bend in the, in the, uh, in the solenoid and uh, give us a pattern out there in the other muon stations that we have. <clears throat> 
so I promise I'll get to the, uh, to the results in, in just a moment, but I do need to say a few words on jets. <coughs> so, so what is a jet? So you're gonna, you know, I might say the word jet quite often, so just wanna make sure that people know what I mean. So, um, well, quarks and gluons, we can't observe these uh, completely by themselves, right? Quarks are confined. Um, but they, they uh, undergo the process of hydrogenization, and then they also uh, can, can shower in the detector. So the experimental signature of quarks and gluons are basically a spray of neutral and charged hadrons. So they make tracks in the tracker and energy deposits in our, in our calorimeters. And then we just uh, you know, reconstruct a, this spray of particles that we call a jet. Okay? And there's also a special case, so if you're looking for particles that are that originated from a B quark, uh, we are able to tag a jet specifically um, as, as, uh, as coming from a B hadron because B hadrons are longer lived uh, and more massive. So the signature is like as shown in this cartoon here. So <clears throat> you would see a displacement. So if, if this is where the interaction occurred, what we call the primary vertex where the protons collided, <clears throat> you would see some displacement of charged particles relative to that primary vertex because of the long-livedness of these B hadrons. And that's how we're able to tag the B quarks. Okay? So since they get mentioned later, I just want to make sure that people uh, know how, how we do these pattern recognition. So clearly a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, intelligence goes into just the pattern recognitions, even of just these you know, standard model particles, so that we can then uh, perform our analyses. Okay, so how much data have we collected so far? We've been running, uh, well, most recently through, since 2005, and then there was the data that collect, was collected in run one. So we quantify how, the, the, how much data we collect by a, a, a quantity, but basically by uh, integrating the rate of collisions, or we, or, or we call this the luminosity. So it's in units of <coughs> one over cross section, or one over centimeter squared, which would then be inverse Barnes where barn is defined as 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. So now let's imagine we've got our two um, bunches of protons, um, N1 and N2, and they collide with some frequency F. Okay? Then the luminosity is defined by this equation. So let's look at this part of the equation. Right? So it's related to the frequency, of course, F, the frequency of collisions. The number of bunches, so the, uh, so far we've, we've, I think, reached about 2,200 or so bunches. The maximum that the um, uh, LHC can you know, fit into the LHC in the ring is about 2,800 or so. <coughs> and then that gets multiplied by the number of parts. So if you've got the number of bunches times the number of particles per bunch, or the number of protons per bunch, that's, as you can see, is on the order of 10 to the 11 protons in each one of these bunches. And there's, you know, 2,000 of them around the ring. And they're colliding at a frequency of 11,000 hertz. So 11,000 times per second, you know, what is that, you know, uh, uh, 10 to the 11 bun uh, protons per bunch colliding, you know, at, at, at that frequency. And that would, that's the, my last bullet. So yeah, so, so, the, so each bunch, so now if you think of the characteristic size of the bean, so what, what it is, let's say, in X and Y, it's on the order of 15 microns. So basically, it's a few centimeters long, and, uh, but the, the thickness of a hair. Okay? So that animation that I showed you earlier that just showed one proton with the quarks inside, that was not realistic. It's really, think of two lines, that's a bunch is really two lines that, that's basically just a few centimeters long, but the thickness of a hair that have to glide head on. So how do you keep them from... So that, that's, the, that's the amazing thing about the LHC, the, the, all the technology that's gone, the, the, the accelerator physics that has gone into this, right? So they, yes, they, they, with, you know, their protons are charged, so they bend them with the magnet and they have to collide specifically head on. And they try to maintain, because every time they, they collide, the bunches, you know, the, 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 the rest of them, I mean, some of them may not, some of the protons may not s collide head on, but they scatter. So then the bunch, you know, kind of grows and so on. And then at some point, then they dump the beam and then they put new protons in. But yeah, it's, it's really impressive that this happens all the time at this rate and at this size is really precision 
precision accelerator uh, physics that's going on here. And this will get even smaller when we talk about the high luminosity LHC that happens in the 2020, 2025 and beyond. You said it's uh, one centimeter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 in the lab frame, uh, yeah, of the, you know, so imagine the, pro the bunches of protons that are the thickness of a hair, you know, going through each other and passing at a rate of 11,000 times per second. It, you know, I, you know, every time I think about this, I just, I, I just get impressed all over again. Okay, <clears throat> so how much data have we collected so far? Well, uh, since I'm going to talk about uh, also the legacy of the Higgs measurements uh, at the end of run one, I want to tell you that in tw 2012, remember the center mass energy was lower, it was at 8 TeV. This integrated luminosity was 23 in units of inverse femtobarns. <coughs> and uh, the peak luminosity, right, because we just said that, you know, when, when they, protons first uh, get injected and they first start colliding, uh, we can measure the, the peak luminosity and then that kind of drops off, is, uh, uh, was about 7.7 .7 hertz per nanobarn, okay? Uh, and just to kind of compare that with what we've t done uh, in 2016, just last year, the peak luminosity doubled, okay? So that's pretty impressive, actually. That was really, uh, in some sense, unexpected. We weren't expecting to get such high luminosity uh, so quickly. Uh, and then the overall integrated luminosity was, is more than double uh, what, what was just in 2012, okay? So then if you multiply, and that's per experiment, so if you multiply this by two, each experiment has collected about 40 inverse femtobarns of data, roughly. And you can sort of see this here, so this is just from Atlas, the, how much luminosity was, so this is this integrated luminosity of 40 inverse femtobarns in 2016, and you can compare that to the blue in 2012. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then a similar type of uh, plot in, uh, for CMS as a function of time just for 2016. So what do we expect? <clears throat> so first of all, the LHC exceeded. It was, the goal for last year was to deliver 25 in resumptive barns, and they delivered much more. Uh, and we expect about 150 or so in resumptive barns by the end of run two, so by the end of 2018. It's so just a kind of, this is the data sets that we're talking about for this run. But there's a price unfortunately. <laughs> and the price is that, there, well, there's a lot of protons in these bunches, and uh, that means that there's a high probability that more than one of them will collide every time they, they pass each other, the bunches pass each other. And so, so yes, many, much more than two. So here is, an, so here is a distribution uh, from Atlas that shows you the mean number of interactions per crossing, and you can see the light blue is 2016, and it's a, it's a distribution, right? And it has a long tail, it goes out to 50, but you know, mo the bulk of it is you know, between 20 and 30. So there's 20 or 30 collisions every time these bunches cross each other, okay? So what are those collisions of? The, the, of the protons. Oh, but then we have to identify, then we trigger on these collisions to, to then uh, select the, 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 the types of collisions that we're interested in that would have the well, pattern a collision, of collision, just two protons yes. coming together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah. But remember, but the thing is, the, uh, the protons are complex objects, right? So, you know, it's not just the, two, the three uh, quarks that are inside, right? And at these energies, there's, you know, the, at these energies, the, the, the protons are really balls of gluons in some sense, right? So the LHC is really, a, it's the large gluon collider, is like what I like to tell my students, because that's really what it is. And therefore, you've got, you know, gluons, the strong interaction, QCD. So the collisions are quite messy. And you, like I said, have multiple collisions in, in an event. So here's the distribution that I mentioned from Atlas. And then here's a picture uh, that we like to show from CMS, which shows all the charge tracks. And you can see wherever they, uh, it's maybe a little hard to see here, but wherever, you know, a lot of tracks are, s seem to, you know, uh, be coming from the same point, that's a, a single interaction. So this particular one has 29 distinct vertices uh, that basically correspond to 29 distinct co head-on collisions in a single crossing, okay? And I have another image a little bit later that, uh, that you'll kind of also see a different point of view of this. Okay, so the L and LHC, right, like I mentioned earlier, it's large, but uh, 
Um, you know, it's large in many ways, and I really like to emphasize this in, in a kind of a, in a talk like this, because um, it kind of really puts things in perspective. Um, obviously, it produces a lot of data. Okay, so you can think of the L and LHC as well, lots of data. Like we said, 20 millions per crossing per second in run one. Actually, now there's 40 million uh, in run two. So that in uh, increase between run one and run two. Uh, and the record, <coughs> sorry, we re record or trigger on the most interesting of these events. So even though this is the rate of collisions, um, uh, 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 or actually the rate of crossings, I should say, we only uh, collect about 500 of these events per second because uh, otherwise we are, you know, first of all, it, most of it is, is not the, uh, uh, events that we're interested in. And second, we, we, can't, we don't have the technology to possibly collect all of this data all at, all at once. Did, did you tell us what a crossing is? Yes, yeah, yeah, the crossing I just mean uh, the, when the bunches cross each other, that's what I mean. Not necessarily a head-on collision, because within that there's you know, billions of protons, but uh, every time a, uh, a bunch of protons cross each other, that's what I mean by a crossing. But so is 29 the usual number of collisions together for crossing? Here? Yeah. No, as you can see, this is tw 29, and 29 is right here, so it's not that unusual. You can sort of see this is the distribution. So the actual an event is one collision? An event is one collision, yeah. Exactly, 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 mm-hmm, right. Uh, right, so then we, in terms of recording the data, it could fill, okay, maybe DVDs are sort of an out, outdated uh, thing to compare it to these days. Maybe I should you know, translate this into you know, what you can fill, fit on your iPod or something. Um, but the data recorded could fill about a million DVDs, which is about 20 or 30 petabytes every year, okay? So that's one thing that the other thing that the L can stand for. And the, another thing that the L can stand for, obviously, is the number of people, right? It's really a large number of physicists. So you might ask, well, what, you know, do people like Andy and, uh, and his colleagues here, how can they contribute to an experiment that has, you know, three or 4,000 other physicists? You know, how can you make, make an impact um, well, each, you know, the members of these co large collaboration, they contribute to the construction of the detectors, the operation, the day-to-day -day operation. So you need a lot of people to be able to, you know, be there in the control room when we're taking data. Uh, as you saw there, I mean, there's, uh, well, there's a lot of data to process. So there's computing projects that people can work on. Uh, you know, the reconstruction of these very complex uh, objects. Um, so then people can really gain a large range of experiences. And small groups can then take on specialized physics analyses uh, in you know, particular regions of data, and you can then have a really large impact. So small groups do have a large impact. And though, even though I'm not on Atlas, I know that the NYU group here has a really large effort at the LHC. They search for new physics. They have leadership roles in the simulation, data preservation. And I know that they were a host of the Atlas Week last year because some of my, of my friends uh, you know, on Atlas, we're here in the area, and uh, was an excuse to come to New York. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that you know, kind of is useful. And then this pie chart. Then, you know, I'd like to also show this pie chart that kind of shows you the distribution of, you know, how the, uh, you know, so this is particular to CMS, but the same is true for Atlas. How, you know, the physicists are are kind of uh, broken up, and you can sort of see that there. So you have a large range of uh, different. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, large range of, uh, uh, you know, people from PhD students to um, undergraduates as well. Okay, so what do we see at the LHC? Obviously, we discovered the Higgs. So how rare, for example, is a Higgs boson being produced at the LHC? How often does that happen? Actually, it doesn't happen compared to other things that are happening, it doesn't happen very often. So let me explain this, uh, this distribution here. This shows you the cross-section and units of nanobarns. And note this is a log scale as a function of center of mass energy. So, um, so this was you know, at the Tevatron, uh, back at, at Fermilab, where we discovered the, the, the top quark. And here's the LHC. So this is 7 TV in the dashed line. The solid line is 8 TV. And this is 13 TV here, which is the most recent one. And we can, you can follow now from this plot, you can follow the, this table. So here's, and here this table shows you the number of events that are produced per second at, let's say, the peak luminosity, at the, basically at the very beginning. Uh, so any interaction is on the order of, so this is the total cross-section, so we're up here. So any interaction we produce about 
a billion events per second, okay? Then, um, you, you know, think, okay, well, then what about, you know, let's say, just, you know, uh, uh, bottom pork production? Uh, well, that's about a million per second. That's basically this red line here. Uh, and then moving down, we can skip that. We can look at, well, how often are W and Z bosons produced? That's these sort of green lines here, so that, that's over here. There's about 1,000 and 100, respectively, per second. Uh, there's about one top quark per second, roughly, where is the uh, uh, TT bar, T, yeah, here's the TT bar cross-section right here. So uh, one uh, pair, well, uh, pair-produced top quarks uh, uh, are being produced per second. And then the Higgs <coughs> uh, boson production, well, there, it's broken up here into the different uh, uh, ways you can produce it. But basically, um, at, at the mass that we've uh, measured it to be, it's basically here, so we're producing a fraction or basically a tenth of an event roughly per second uh, at the peak luminosity, right? So, <clears throat> and the new physics is even lower, right? Again, this is a log scale would be down here. So clearly it's very small. But we benefit actually quite largely by going from 8 TV to, uh, to 13 TV. Uh, this increase in center of mass energy, especially for the Higgs, uh, the uh, uh, probability of producing a Higgs increases by a roughly a factor of two, okay? So what have we learned in run one? Well, obviously we discovered the Higgs boson and we've measured its properties. I'm gonna say something about that in just a moment. We've done a detailed exploration of the standard model. So this uh, uh, a plot, which you can't really see very well at all, but it's done so on purpose, shows you the measured cross sections as a function of different processes uh, and also compared to the, uh, uh, the theoretical prediction. <laughs> and, they all, they, and they all agree. So it's really a precise exploration, precise measurements of the standard model from boson production to top quark production to Higgs production. And of course, we've done a broad program of searches beyond, beyond the standard model. And again, this uh, figure here, which you can't really read, is, is, a, is effectively showing that we've extensively uh, probed the Terra scale. But let me, I want to say a few words about the Higgs and you know, what have we learned uh, about the Higgs uh, since its discovery. But before we do that, let me just remind you, first of all, how it's produced and how it decays. Okay? So, the, so it's produced <clears throat> in a couple of different ways. It can be produced either through the fusion of, uh, of, of gluons, and actually this is the dominant process. Uh, it can be produced through the fusion of vector bosons, which are denoted by these squiggly lines here, so Ws or Zs. Uh, it can be produced in association with a, uh, a vector boson, a W or Z here. Um, or it can be produced through the fusion of top quarks. Okay, and this one is actually quite important. I'm going to say something about that. But then how does it decay? Well, here are the decay modes. You can see it decays to uh, BB bar pairs actually quite a lot. Uh, uh, to pairs of uh, uh, W bosons, tau's, Z bosons, and photons. And I circle these, so even though they're fractionally, in terms of percent branching ratio, small compared to these others, they were real, these are really the golden channels. So these were the channels that were used in the discovery because they, w, uh, sorry, uh, Z bosons and photons produce clean objects and very narrow mass peaks and therefore low backgrounds, and we were able to see these resonances above the background quite, quite nicely. And actually, you saw a, a, a picture of that before, but I'm going to show it to you again. So, <clears throat> so here we have the, basically, the, these plots here show you the legacy of the Higgs mass measurements from run one. So the discovery, uh, uh, the, the kind of final uh, um, uh, d uh, discovery plots. So this is showing you, from, well, you know, so I, you know, show you one distribution from Atlas, one from CMS, but we, of course, both saw them in, in, in both channels. So this is Higgs decaying to two photons, and this is the mass distribution. Uh, and well, it's probably hard to see for people all the way in the back, but this is 120 to 130. And this, so, so you he, see here the, the yield as a function of mass, the spe mass spectrum, and you see this little bump here, which is the resonance of the dose. So this is subtracting off the continuous background, and you can see 
the resonance here at 125 GeV. Similarly, in the case of the uh, Higgs decaying to two Z bosons, then the Zs decay to leptons, so then you have a four lepton final state. And so this is net mass now of the four leptons, and you see a beautiful bump here at 125 GeV. So the fact that both experiments saw these resonances in the same place and in the channels that one would expect to come from the Higgs, well, we knew that we had discovered a new particle. Okay? And what have we been doing since then, besides analyzing the RUN2 data, there has been a huge effort to try to combine the measurements from both experiments because then you can double your statistics and make really precise measurements. So here is a likelihood distribution of the fit of the data from both experiments, from, from both of these channels. And you can see that the minimum of this fit is at 125 GeV. It's actually at 125.09, and you can see the statistical and systematic errors. And this is sort of the breakdown of all of the L of these. This is, uh, and then, so in this box here is the number that you see here. So the mass, which is the most important property of a particular part of a, uh, you know, saying that you have a new particle, First of all, it gives a clear sig a pic signature that it's a new particle, and it's pretty amazing that at the end of the day, just with the run one data, the mass has been measured with a 0.2% uncertainty. That's really precise, okay? So we know the Higgs mass very precisely. But then we ask ourselves, is it the Higgs of the standard model? Well, first of all, there's two important fingerprints. The first one is one of the ones that I mentioned at the very beginning, which is the spin and parity of the particle. And what we've done uh, in, in both experiments is use a technique that actually, you know, it basically it, it uses the angular distributions of the decay products. So uh, for those of you that, you know, take an intro particle physics class, it's just like the pi on parity measurement in the four electron channel. So basically, so for example, Higgs decays to ZZ, the Z decays to two leptons each, the two leptons each form a pl two planes, and the angle between those two planes gives you that angular distribution. You can use that to discriminate between a zero plus or a zero minus. And of course, well, at the LHC, we do things a bit more um, sophisticated, so here's actually a likelihood distribution <clears throat> that basically shows the zero uh, uh, minus hypothesis in the red and the zero plus hypothesis in the blue, and the black line shows the data and shows that it's very consistent with the zero plus hypothesis. Check. Seems like it's a scalar particle. The other fingerprint is that the couplings to fermions and bosons uh, are they consistent with the standard model predictions? And again, indeed, it seems that they are. So here are the couplings uh, as a function of particle mass from various decay modes. Uh, and you can see that they scale with mass just like the uh, standard model prediction, which is the blue line, uh, uh, would, uh, uh, tells us that it, that it does. The red is the fit to these measurements and the yellow and green are sort of the uncertainties around that. So it seems to really indicate that this is truly the Higgs of the standard model. So the final run one data analysis indicates that so far this particle really is the one of the standard model. And this chart just further demonstrates that. This is now just showing you now a breakdown uh, of the measurements as, uh, in the different production modes that I mentioned before. Obviously the one that um, has the most sensitivity, you can even see that just based on the error bars, is this gluon-gluon fusion measurement, and then as, as a function of the decay. And then this is just the, uh, the signal strength relative to the standard model cross-section. Okay? Again, so it seems to behave like the standard model. Okay, picture worth a thousand words. This just shows you how uh, you, you know, unique, unique the different uh, channels look in our detector and we can recognize them with, with their different signatures. Okay, but I'll speed up a little bit now because I do want to say a few words about, well, what do we know now, uh, you know, with the 13 TeV data at the LHC? Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to actually skip a few things. So one of the things, obviously, we, what, what we need to do is rediscover, let's say, the standard model in run two. 
And I, well, I showed you, right, uh, uh, mass spectra are clearly the thing that we, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that are, you know, obvious things that we, uh, what, that we measure, just like we did for the, in the Higgs discovery. Uh, and here, this is the invariant mass spectrum of two uh, muons, a mu plus and mu minus. And, well, you see this very beautiful spectrum of lots of particles that we know and love. You open up the particle data book and lo and behold, we see strange anti-strange mesons, charm anti-charm mesons, bottom anti-bottom mesons, right? So these were all discoveries that I showed you on that initial <laughs> histogram that showed you, you know, the uh, uh, discoveries as a, function of, uh, as a function of time in different accelerators. We discovered them again extremely precisely. Note this is a log scale. Here's our Z boson, which is extremely useful for calibrating the detector. Uh, and then, of course, one of the obvious things is to keep looking at the, uh, the rest of this distribution to see if a new resonance pops up out there, then that's a key indication of, of new physics. Right, so then we have our standard candles. Right? We have our W's, uh, W's and Z's. Um, so I won't say much more about that. So here is now the dimuon, this is this dimuon mass spectrum, uh, but zoomed in. And they really are standard candles. They allow us to calibrate the detector, both the electromagnetic detector in the case of dielectrons, the muon momentum scale used for efficiencies. And of course, we make very precise measurements, as you can see here in, the, in this cross-section plot as a function of center mass energy. This is the 13 TeV measurements here of the Ws and Zs. Another standard candle is the top quark. And I, I'm not gonna skip this plot because this is actually quite important. It'll tie into another measurement that I wanna mention before, um, before we wrap up. So the top quark uh, at, at the LHC is produced in pairs primarily. And just a reminder, the top quark, remember the top quark is really heavy. It's a 173 GeV. It's so heavy that it doesn't have time to turn into a hadron, right? So it decays, it decays immediately, and it decays immediately to a W boson and a B quark, right? And here's the anti-top, W boson and a B quark. And then the Ws can either decay leptonically to charged lepton and neutral lepton, or to quarks, okay? And that basically gives you different signatures of, of TT bar production. Um, and this is quite important. It's important to measure, make measurements of, of, uh, of top quark decays because, well, it's so heavy that it's coupling to the, well, it's, it's coupling to the Higgs is roughly one, so it teaches us something about the Yukawa coupling. And perhaps it plays a special role in electroweak symmetry break breaking. And fortunately for us, actually now, the LHC really produces quite a lot of tops. It's, it's like a top factory. Uh, and you can even see here, this is um, showing you uh, measurements of the cross-section of, of TT bar production in picobarns as a function of center mass energy. So these are older measurements from, uh, uh, well, yeah, for the Tevatron down here, uh, and then the uh, LHC at eight, 7 and 8 TV. And here we are at 13 TV. And note, this is a log scale. So the cross-section at 8 TV to 13 TV went from like 250 picobarns to 800. So we're really producing quite a lot of tops. And you can see here's a, a, a nice event display of uh, an event from Atlas that it, uh, is consistent with a, uh, with a TT bar event where the both double use decay leptonically. So you have your muon here, an electron, and a couple of jets, which are presumably coming from the B quarks. And here, you know, we can really see in this number of jet distribution, the red uh, is, uh, shows you the uh, uh, what you know, the TT t bar, and you can see really that there's there's quite a lot. Again, this is um, you know thousands of events. So this is quite important because we really you know measuring the top uh, quark and how it it's, you know what kind of role it plays in electroweak symmetry breaking is 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 quite something something that we really want to understand, and I'll come back to that. Okay, so. Obviously, I can't talk about all the precise measurements, but I can sort of show you a summary uh, plot here that just like in run one, in run two, we've already made many precise measurements at 13 TeV uh, of you know, processes that are not so rare, like TT bar that I just mentioned, and also ones that are very rare with cross sections that are tens of picobarns rather than 800 uh, picobarns. 
um, uh, such as single top, dibosin production, and so on. And these are really important, not in and of it themselves in terms of making measurements, precise measurements of uh, um, sta standard model measurements, but understanding these are critical for Higgs measurements and new physics searches, okay? So let me say something about the Higgs. Okay, so we've rediscovered the Higgs in run two, the plots I showed you earlier with, were the, at the end of run one. Both experiments ha now have new results in several channels. Uh, and in particular, the golden channels, what I call the golden channels, right? The four lepton and diphoton channels. And you can see the mass distribution, the four lepton mass distribution here on the left, and the diphoton mass distribution here on the right. Again, with the bottom panel showing the background subtracted off, and you can see a nice, beautiful peak. And CMS in particular has a new mass measurement that's just coming from the uh, measurement on the left there, the, the, uh, from the four leptons, the Higgs decaying to, to ZZ, uh, that make, makes a measurement of the Higgs mass that's in the red box there of 125 plus or minus 0.2 plus or minus 0.8. And I want to emphasize that even, so this is just one measurement in one channel with all of the data collected in the LHC, uh, collected so far, and that one measurement gives us a more precise measurement than the run one world average, which was measured to 0.2%. So really already with, you know, uh, you know, with all the data that we have, we're, you know, obviously we've collected you know, twice as much data, but we're able to make precision measurements, uh, of not just of, the, and hopefully as time goes on, not just of the mass, but of, of all the other properties, right? So now with this data, new data, we continue to study the behavior of this new particle, measuring its properties, looking for anomalies, and rare decay modes or couplings. And I just want to give you two examples uh, um, uh, be, uh, be, you know, before, before I finish. So, but before I do that, I, want to uh, yeah, I wanted to show this event display. This is actually pretty cool that you guys did, actually, I have to say. This event display, it's, a, it's an Atlas event display of a Higgs candidate event in this ZZ channel. So we've got two electrons. Here are your electrons. So this is now looking in the Z direction, right? So along the interaction point. <clears throat> so this is a, a signature of an electron. Here's another electron. This, these two red lines are indicators of photons. You can also sort of see it uh, here when you sort of, in, a, in the view where we've unrolled the detector, <clears throat> the A to 5 view. But then this bottom panel here is really cool because each one of these dots shows, so this is a particular event, this is, you know, an event that was collected from one of the beam crossings. And you can see each of these dots represent, represents an interaction from that crossing. And remember, we said that there could be many of them, up to 20, 30, and, and, and higher. So each one of these, and obviously they, they've subtracted off all the other tracks from, from this, uh, this view, so this is along the z-axis. But here, all these interactions occurred, and the one that gave, the one that in this particular case gave us a, a Higgs boson candidate was this one here, right? Even though all these other co uh, interactions uh, uh, also happened. So it really kind of put, puts in perspective that this is really needle in the haystack type of physics. Yeah, yeah. Did they do something? Yeah, the, the, the other track, the tracks are, for visual purposes, right. the tracks are suppressed. Right. Yeah. But my question is how are the tracks there at all if you're selecting you know, 500 per second? It seems very odd that you would be selecting all 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the five, yeah, so the five hundred per second is all, all. It's the rate of everything that we actually collect and we put onto tape. Then within that, we have separate triggers, like ones that select, you know, leptons or jets or combinations, you know, photons or missing energy and, and so on. And we sort of group them together into different categories of final state signatures. So this, the, you know, these events presumably came from some le lepton t triggers. Uh, so it's a subset of all of, uh, of all of the events. I don't know. Does that answer your question? It's not, it's not coming from all the 500 events per second that... Uh, right, I guess if, if only 500 events per second are being written... To yes, take, yes. Right, that means yes. the number of events per crossing has to be some minuscule number, right? No, 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 thing. no. No, an event is the whole thing. The yeah, whole yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The event is the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I don't mean by, I don't mean by each of one of these. The, each one of these are called this. You know, this, this is within one of the crossings, right? Because the crossings are happening every 25 nanoseconds. So within that 25 nanoseconds, we have, we can only, call, you know, we, we have to then make a decision of which ones we want to keep but, and which. So, okay. So I was going to be at the beginning. There were yeah. 20 million crossings. Yeah. Per, 
second. Per second, yes. And you wrote 500 events. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Maybe it was I was mixing. Crossings. Yeah. 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 I, I was mix, I mix, I, In that case, I mixed crossing and event. Yes. 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 Sorry about that. Okay. Cool. So uh, let me just uh, 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 make a, a quick point here. So I mentioned the top cork earlier, and I also mentioned all the different ways that the Higgs can get produced. And one of the ways the Higgs gets produced is. <clears throat> through the process of top quark fusion. And then you get, you get a, fine, a signature of two top quarks produced in a, or a top and an anti-top produced in association with a Higgs boson. We actually haven't, uh, with high significance, uh, uh, said that this, you know, uh, observed the Higgs in this process. Okay? Uh, you know, we, in particle physics, we have this threshold of five standard deviations above the background, so statistical uh, significance above the background, uh, we call that a kind of a, a discovery. So we haven't actually observed this particular process. So we're searching for it, both experiments actively, uh, because this one is really pr uh, important because it probes the Yukawa coupling between the top quark and the Higgs. The heaviest particle that we know of, fundamental particle that we know of, which is the top quark, and how it couples to the Higgs. Right? So, so this process is actually quite important from that point of view. Um, and we, we, you know, we are benefiting from the fact that going from 8 to 13 TeV, the cross section, so I mentioned that the Higgs cross section grows by a factor of 2. That's sort of in general for all the processes, but in particular for this process, the cross section is four times larger. Okay? It's a very difficult search. It needs a very detailed understanding of standard model backgrounds, in particular coming from, so actually here you can see, this is a, here's a, an example of this process being produced in a signature with uh, multiple leptons. So you can see here tops decay to W and B again. In this case, the W, let's say, decays to two bosons. And again, the bosons either decay to leptons or quarks, and you get signatures of multi, multiple leptons. So, and then this gets thrown into a multivariate analysis, like a boosted decision tree. So this is the output of that. And you can see <clears throat> the red is the TTH, the t uh, top uh, 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 hypothesis. So that, that would be the signal. Uh, and the green here is backgrounds from tops produced with a V stands for vector boson. So TT bar plus either a W or a, hit, or a, a Z. So you can see that most of the background is coming from that. So it's a difficult search that needs, obviously, a detailed understanding of these kinds of standard model backgrounds and, like I said, use of these multivariate techniques. And here's just one example of this kind of analysis where, so far, we haven't we sort of reached what we call uh, evidence for, but not quite observation because we've reached a significance of just about three sigma. And you can sort of see this measurement here is highlighted here in uh, the circle. And I see I'm running out of time, so I was going to mention something about also the other, uh, uh, you know, so now we're really kind of digging deep in terms of Higgs searches. Uh, we, you know, for example, we're also searching for Higgs decaying to muons, which is actually even more challenging and even because it's extremely rare process. But again, it also has an importance because of now we can probe the coupling of the Higgs to second generation fermions, like a muon. Uh, and also testing the dependence of the Higgs, uh, <clears throat> the mass dependence and the coupling to leptons, for example. And here, I just want to show you the mass distribution of dimuons. And uh, I want, so the Higgs hypothesis, Higgs decaying to muon hypothesis is in the red. But note, it's actually multiplied by a factor of 20. So we're really not quite sensitive to this yet. It's going to take a bit of time um, and you know, uh, you know, and a lot of analysis. But both experiments are really actively working on trying to make these kinds of measurements. OK, so I think I've, I ran out of time. I was going to mention, you know, so people can ask me. I was going to say something about searches for uh, other new physics, other new particles. I actually suspected that I wasn't. Uh, going to uh, um, uh, uh, be able to cover that, but feel free to ask me a question. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just say that run, run two is off to a great start. There's many results that I couldn't cover. I tried to focus specifically on Higgs 
uh, um, but you know, we're, of course, we're searching also for uh, for, for many new particles uh, and making lots of uh, measurements. This is just sort of uh, you know, kind of a summary of the reaches of the uh, uh, you know the Terra scale. Uh, uh, reaches that we've uh, uh, obtained by, by making these searches. Uh, obviously, at a 13 TeV collider, we're sort of excluding particles at, you know, the multi TeV level. But of course, there's more to come. As I mentioned in the beginning, it's a long road ahead for the LHC. We're, you know, we're only here, and it's a multi-year program. Um, and well, stay tuned. So um, I leave you here uh, with a, an a event display of a, of a diphoton event, uh, like we saw also for the Higgs, and um, you know, and a bunch of happy people, <laughs> um, which of course will become even more happy, uh, you know, as you know, as, as we collect more data and hopefully uh, gear up for discovery. The potential is there. Like I said, we expect about 150 inverse femtobarns uh, at the end of, of run two, which is in 2018. And then for the high luminosity LHC, by the time we get to, let's say, 2020, 2030, it's going to increase by, by multiple factors. So, so really, the best is yet to come. So I'll, I'll end here. Thanks. OK, thanks for the great talk. So we have time for some questions. I think that you can be able to remember the W Yes. How we compare with the LEP result, the precision? Uh, how does it compare with the LEP result? Yeah, that was, that's a measurement uh, that was made by the ATLAS experiment. Um, well, I mean, there, uh, it, it's the, the LEP result and also the, 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 the Tevatron. I don't think it's as precise. I don't remember what the value is off the top of my head. But I think you know, it, it's much more difficult to do these kinds of measurements at a Hadron Collider. Keep in mind that. Um, at the Tevatron, for example, at the you know, proton-antiproton collider at Fermilab that you know, uh, uh, Andy and I uh, were on, that measurement took many, many years and years after the Tevatron stopped running. So these are very, very challenging measurements. I'm actually quite impressed that the, that the, that the W mass measurement even came out. But I don't remember. What's the precision? I can't remember. It was, off better, the than the Tevatron. It was better than the Tevatron, but I'm not sure if it was better than better than, than, better than it was yeah. It's close in precision, right? So, but I don't think it's, it's a little yeah, lower, so yeah. It's only a I think value. what I remember, yeah. sorry. It was a little lower in central value, so things oh, really? only agree better with the standard model. Right? How, how much is uh, this? Point one GeV. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's impacting the combination of uh, that. That's all I remember, but I don't remember the exact uh, the exact precision. Yeah, it, that's a really challenging measurement. <laughs> So what's uh, your favorite, or where do you think is the most promising place to find new physics going forward? Yeah, if I knew that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but um, I, I'm personally um, interested in new physics signatures where the particles you know, coupled to strongly produced particles like quarks and gluons. So uh, signatures where there's multiple jets in the final state. So uh, I mean, because there's so many models that produce this. So I mean, so for example, one of the things that I didn't get to talk about was a supersymmetry signature. <clears throat> so for example, I mean, this is just one model. But for example, supersymmetry. So here are, let's say, pairs of gluinos being produced, and then decay to multiple jets plus some missing energy. Uh, and then here's you know, another, uh, you know, so there's many possible possibilities. So signatures where there's m m many jets in the final state, even though it's quite hard from the point of view of, you know, there's lots of QCD background and things like this, you know, that's where your cross sections are also going to be quite large. And then there's a, a lots of tools that now people are using um, you know, to look for, you know, to kind of, you know, look for these types of signatures in a more efficient way, which I haven't really talked about in this talk, but uh, can talk about. I'm happy to talk about it offline. But I mean, but I don't, I don't know where where it will appear clearly. But that's sort of uh, where I put my efforts on. <laughs> yeah. Can you comment on the status of the proposed 100 TV collider? 
And also the linear polarizer. Oh, gosh. What, what, is, the, what is the situation now? Um, well, I think it's, you know, it's really, uh, you know, far into the, far into the future. I mean, people are, you know, obviously there are a lot of people that are doing studies. There's discussions of where it would be hosted, where, you know, obviously, you know, you know, China is potentially putting a lot of, you know, effort into potentially hosting this. It's just so far into the future that right now, I mean, I personally, I mean, I can't, I, I can't think that far ahead. <laughs> um, but, I mean, obviously there, there are people that are, I mean, it will, the thing is, these kinds of things will immediately change the moment we discover something, right? So the fact that, that we have these types of discussions is good, um, but the only way to focus, you know, you know, you know even li linear collider and things like this, it, it will, will, it'll become clear when we discover some new physics, because then we'll know the scale, we'll try to understand its properties, and then be able to figure out what kind of collider that we, we would build. Um, right now, it's all up, up in, 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 dis in discussion. Nothing, nothing on shell, let's say. The high luminosity LHC is definitely is. That's happening. It's being. It's going to be funded, um, also by the U.S. and of course internationally. Then beyond that, it's anybody's guess. I don't know. Do you want to <laughs> say anything else about that? I think we're building it. We're building it soon. <laughs> Wait, isn't that something like 2030 that that comes out, or am I even confused? No. The, which one? Which one? High luminosity, yes, you're, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's a little hard to hear. It's, it's a very, very long time to wait if there's not new physics. It's a very long time to wait if there's new physics, but there's also a lot of uh, analysis, data analysis to, I mean, it, you know, we have, you know, we'll have the data, we'll do kind of some of the, let's say, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it is a long time to wait, indeed. They're busy building detectors, which is also fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we go through these phases. Yes. 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 Yes.